So the purpose of this session is to uh, really for you to, to, to have a chance to um, ask questions and express views. We're, we're here, of course, we've been talking about the contributions of, of, of David Fontana, so you may, of course, want to ask questions or make comments about the particular topics we've talked about today, in particular about well, general comments about personal psychology or psychological research or survival or um, um, ITC or indeed scope. But also, this is a, a, a day in memory of, of David, so people would like to make any personal comments about David, um, that's also appropriate. I mean, obviously, if you're making, addressing questions, you can make it clear who you are addressing your questions to on the panel. And if you're just making a comment or a recollection of David, that obviously will not necessarily require a response. But, um, so I think, I mean, I would first of all ask, I don't know if there's anything, any member of the committee, sorry, any member of the committee, <laughs> any member of the panel speakers, any comment you would like to make in terms of the general theme of the day and then in, in connection between other speakers. I mean, there's no need to do that. No. So in that case, I'm going to immediately open this up to the floor. Um, I will just say one comment first of all. A number of people couldn't be here um, and have sent messages. I'm sure there are many other people who couldn't send messages. Here, for example, there's a message from Trisha Robertson up in Glasgow, who, of course, um, many of you will know she's spoken to the SPR on many occasions. She's the former president of the SSPR um, and uh, currently, I think, the secretary. So let me just read it briefly. Due to a previous lecture commitment, I'm regretfully unable to attend the study day to make a tribute to David Fontana. On a personal note, David was a very kind and loyal friend to me for approximately 16 years. He supported me with words of encouragement during some very negative times. He was also a great supporter of my work, and that meant a lot to me. I'm sure that Archie Roy, if he was able, would also like to add his admiration of David's character and his work as a field psychological researcher. Uh, who can forget Pete? Pete, being, of course, the part of Poltergeist we heard about from Alan. David was an honorary president of the SSPR, the Scottish Society of Psychic Research, for many years, and everybody thought that he was just wonderful. When he lectured to us at the University of Glasgow, large numbers were assured. In my official capacity as on set for the SSPR, the Society would like to pay tribute to him by recognizing the years of dedication that he gave to his research. We will definitely miss him the whole great fondness in our hearts. Trisha Wallace. So, so that is just a message, message for Trisha who can't be here, I'm sure there are many other people who would, would make similar comments to you, David. So, but at this stage I would like to ask you to make comments or address questions to the speakers. Donald. I'm afraid you have to speak up because of the noise of the children. I would just like to add my own appreciation for David Fontana because I thought that he was an admirable person and that he was so tolerant of many people's different approaches and what they didn't want to do. And uh, he was always considered in that respect. And um, I would really like to uh, ask um, Anna, um, who said that, and I quite agree with him, he said that uh, we really do need uh, to do more than uh, working with authority, but really to study all the unexplained things which appear to be happening in everyday life, including, of course, um, things in the um, <coughs> science room, like the school report. And he did say that um, we should be following up the school report. And Marion said that um, nobody has tried to reproduce these effects in similar conditions. Well, I think the greatest disappointment, at least for me, uh, about the Stone Report was the uh, <coughs> cessation of the existence at the point when uh, it was so extremely interesting and people in the SDR wanted it to go on and make it even more conclusive than it appeared to be. And yet, 
for some reason, uh, the spirits of whoever they were uh, refused. And that was to my mind the most disappointing thing. Although I was myself privileged to attend one uh, session, and um, I was very grateful to the quantity and uh, to be invited to do that. I think it was a privilege. And this is a very interesting um, episode. But it finished tragically. Marion, will you play it again? You did make a reference in your talk to the some higher authority that uh, said that they should discontinue. Yes, I thought that this was rather strange, but that's what they were saying, that there was someone higher, just not the ordinary team, it was other people. It was as though they were getting um, almost too close to some of the ideas that, that, um, that the SBR investigated, were getting a bit too close to some of the ideas about the next world. Maybe we're not supposed to know everything about it, maybe that's what they were saying. But um, I think they were try, wanting to try other experiments, and they did start that with Hank Shire. He did one. They were doing some video, videoing there. Um, but even that was stopped as well. It was just totally, you shouldn't do it anymore. I, I thought the idea was that these the spirits were themselves uh, formerly oh. scientists who were themselves researchers, which was one of the yeah. interesting aspects of yeah. one of the things that this was taken on face value, yes. survives, is an interest in scientific research. So yeah. that seems to imply that the spirits themselves did not have complete yes. information. They were involved in a research process along with the people on yes. Earth. So yeah. the statement you made that uh, we're not supposed to find these things mm. is a bit puzzling because I thought they were the spirits yeah. and the humans all meant to be in it together. Um, yes, it looks as though they were it's supposed to be in it together, and yet at some point they were stopped. And I mean, there's no explanation, obviously, for that, really. So that's just my guesswork, um, rather than um, saying, yes, this is what they were told. But certainly the, the people who were communicating, when the, the team were there communicating, appeared to be getting information from other people who were there. And some of them were not good at communicating because they were saying that it takes actually time to learn how to communicate with this world, which I think is what Anne Harrison would say as well, that it takes a little while for people to learn how to communicate. If one looks at the history of previous um, physical um, groups, mm -hmm. science groups, is there a tendency that when they reach a certain stage, they, they are similarly ordered to stop because they got too close to the truth or something? Or is this rather unique to the skull case? Because obviously we know in general there aren't many physical groups anymore. No. But I mean, no. Is there a precedent for a successful group like this being told to stop because this seems to be getting interesting? I don't know of any other group, of, sorry, I don't know of any other group apart from the skull group, but maybe someone else would have an idea. Yes, um, I don't know how relevant this is. There isn't a precedent in terms of mediumship. Well, maybe there is. But it reminds me a hell of a lot of some of the writings of people like um, Jacques Vallée in Ufology. He wrote a whole book on revelations, which is basically about a series of things that they appear to be sort of... I don't mean... <laughs> They appear basically to be host scenarios where a fish is dangled in front of an investigator who constantly snatched away and he's often very vague about just who the hoaxer is, you know, whether it's an earthly hoax or something else. But a lot of the communications that come through remind me very much of the kind of communications that uh, UFO contactees and channelers get. And, it, you know, um, another writer, John Keel, speculated that maybe these voices have a common origin. And I have absolutely no idea that these ideas have validity, but there do seem to be common patterns. Do other members of the panel wish to comment? Um, well, I certainly comment uh, with respect to this is a deep depth. We just simply do not understand the rules. 
And before we even get into the question of what, if, what or how post-mortem survival and communication takes place, I always try to make the point that as you all of us sitting here, inside each of us going on at this moment, is some kind of mysterious force and activity which neither physics, biology, psychology, or any other established science, either individually or in combination, actually can currently explain. And what we can say is we, we think there is something we describe as a subconscious mind that is immensely powerful. We do not know how it operates, and every night most of us will go to sleep and have dreams where there is no way our conscious self sitting here would consciously, you know, inspiration is a difficult thing, but we would just not imagine these things. If something goes on for a you know, good part of our, our, our lives, which creates things all the time. Now, when we go into this territory, I, I don't think any possible hypothesis, however unlikely, really can be ruled out. Because we do not ultimately understand the material universe. Uh, and daily we, we walk through our lives cheerfully carrying on in the midst of what is the infinite space within infinite time. Now I don't know anyone who gets their head around either the infinity of space or the infinity of time. Um, can the philosopher 200 years ago before quantum physics say, well, these are actually built in ways we see the universe, mm -hmm. but the universe may actually be completely different for all we know. I don't even rule out the possibility, and God was alluded to briefly, one of the things that parapsychology doesn't like looking at is synchronicity and the ideas of John, that there may be deeper and meaningful coincidences going on. There may be an entirely different level of understanding which we have missed entirely. I mean, human beings walked around for centuries in, uh, in a world which was suffused with electromagnetism and electricity, yet they knew nothing about it except lightning flashes and static. Now, probably every one of us has got our own little device, you know, we can carry around, which seems to have mastered the mystery of electricity to some extent. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to, we've got a number of questions. Um, first, the gentleman there. Can you give your name, please? William Eyre. Uh, um, question for Marion, really. Uh, due to the fact that the um, team at Seoul wouldn't give information about the real identities, do you, would you agree that what happened at Seoul was really a fascinating series of demonstrations of psychokinesis and had much more value? in that direction, which is worthwhile from a psychical research perspective in its own right, rather than having much value in terms of providing evidence of survival. Because although they may have claimed to be the streets of the departed, they might have been tolkers or something non-human, or aliens from the dimension, or who knows what. No, I actually do think, this is my personal opinion, that they were spirit communicators. That it, that it wasn't psychokinesis. I think that these spirit communicators found ways of getting this group together, and it was in fact the team, the spirit team, who decided the, the, which people they wanted, of the SBR investigators. And they chose three people who were very amiable people generally, but also had had great experience, but also had had the paranormal happenings. Whereas some other people, as we know, is the goat sheep effect, and that it just doesn't happen with some people, but it certainly would with those three. So I, I think that they were spirit communicators. On the other hand, you're presumably not saying psychic and these may not have anything to do with it, no. because how the, the spirits, if you believe in the spirits yes. producing these physical effects, may well have some connection with what you call psychic yes. and Yes. Um, gentleman with the blue shirt, sorry, I'm picking your name. Uh, nice, nice, Keith. Um, I was reading something in New Scientist a, a few years ago, and it, they were saying that um, when you look at the mass of their any object, like a proton or neutron, its energy, its mass actually comes from the vacuum, and almost 99% of that 
masses from vacuum and the mass of quarks is the same thing, it's just a vacuum energy. So in that way, what we are ultimately composed of is mainly energy, sort of continuous with vacuum. Um, does that have any bearing on what might be going on here or what, what matter may be? And I'm also, I asked Bernard Carr, I said, and also the idea that Anton Zellinger did recently do experiments where he shows that information and reality are kind of doublet and uh, you bring reality into existence by observing photons and things. Is there any connection between that? In that way, we see ourselves more as continuous with vacuum, which is the source of everything, as opposed to matter in space, so it's sort of more continuous with it. Now, I'm asking Professor Carl whether he could. Well, okay, I, mean, I don't want to talk too, too, too many late because I'm the chairman. I feel I'm talking too much. But, but the, the answer to your question is um, clearly, as a physicist, to me, the fascinating issue is these are physical phenomena. We're talking about bits, solar cycle releases, or polygons, or whatever. Therefore, one wants to try and relate it to think ideas of physics. And of course, there's been a lot of writing on that topic. And it would take too long to go through a, a review of all those attempts to make it. But you, you refer specifically to vacuum energy. Now, of course, one of the developments in, in astronomy has <coughs> been the realization that actually most of the universe is, is vacuum energy, it's dark energy. Um, and something like 70% of the energy of the universe is what we call dark energy, which is, is another way of saying vacuum energy. And we don't know what that is from a physical point of view, but they're very serious, maybe the cosmological constant. Now, obviously, therefore, you might say, well, maybe this dark energy has got something to do with the, the energy which is involved. And you ask the physical question about where the proton gets its mass, but I guess you're also asking the question, has this dark energy got anything to do with psychic phenomena? Because so the information of and, I, mean, I suppose the answer is that some people who do pursue that idea, some people are interested in the links between dark energy and subtle energy. Um, and so certainly you cannot exclude that possibility. And I think it would be fair to say there isn't any well-developed theory of physics which explicitly links vacuum energy to these sorts of phenomena. And, and obviously I'm afraid to and most of my physics colleagues would be rather sceptical about such theory, but then I'm afraid most of them are rather sceptical about the phenomena we're talking about anyway. But um, my own view is that you can't rule out something like that. Um, I have my own famous theory which involves hard dimensions, but that might itself have something to do with dark energy. So that's a very, I hope, a rather brief answer to your question, but maybe less as much as it was saying. I think Les would like to say something. I'll just add a little from, from the psychology side. Um, I mean, there's a great deal that is, that is going on here that concerns the psychic and the spiritual sort of so on. Um, but, and, and you refer to unconscious processes. And, and there's no question we do know a lot about pre-conscious and unconscious processes and, and, and what's going on in the brain in relation to that. But clearly that is not the whole story. And uh, the, 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 again, in the spirit of the point that you raised, then many, including myself, would suggest that when we're talking about unconscious processes, we are, we are feeling our way from a psychological narrative towards areas that are discussed and considered in, in the narrative of, of modern physics. So there is that coming together. But just the word of warning is that it's sometimes too easy to bring one mystery to try and explain another mystery. So we have to be careful. Thank you, guys. Um, right, so, um, sorry, the Tim Cole. Thank you for all the speakers and the contribution today. It's very interesting. Um, I do have a couple of questions, one of which is to the general panel, which is really the, the nature of the afterlife in terms of your combined experience and research, what, if you could sort of perhaps each give us a take on what you think the afterlife might be like? That's, maybe if we could all answer very quickly, I mean, uh, because I think, uh, let's start with Chris on the left. My research isn't really concerned with the afterlife, it's more with the people's experiences and their capabilities in this life mm. uh, that may have 
implications for that. So I, I don't know that I've got anything to, to say that answers your question. Well, the other question is what, what, what impact do you think your experiences in this life have on the afterlife, your behaviour, your attitudes, everything? What does, how does, do you think that carries over? Is there an influence? I mean, it's like but the evidence from cases of near-death experience suggests very much that that's the case. But that's the only evidence I have. The, the kind of experimental work and the a qualitative work that we do doesn't really bear on that question. Okay. Yes, I, I, I'd like to echo the, the words that I tried to play from David. I don't think it works well, where he, he said, when he's talking about the other world and beyond the veil, it's here now. And, uh, you know, again, how much can I talk from experience? I don't know what happens after death. Who knows? But what I do know is that in the, 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 myst the mystical traditions that I'm especially interested in, and many writings in the Kabbalah, the discussion is about the world that is coming, and that is understood in the mystical tradition, not as something that's coming after you die, but it's a different dimension that is here now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what I would answer in relation to my experience. You know, whether there's survival of consciousness, whether there's survival of a soul, whether there's a mind, as it were, I just don't know. And as for your question about, notwithstanding what I said, that I can't know, but your other part of the question, I have no doubt that uh, the universe is not a random thing or process, mm -hmm. and there is meaning. In my, my own personal worldview, meaning is at the centre. And I have no doubt that what I do here and now has an impact on Olam Haba, which is the Hebrew word for the world that comes. Yes, I obviously do have an idea that we survive, and that um, I also, from reading about Geraldine Cummings' work, um, she has mentioned quite a lot of what the next world is like. Um, and if you want to know, I'd say read Geraldine Cummings, because she's actually written quite a lot of um, work um, with um, her Gibbs, who um, actually she lived with for quite some while, um, who actually then um, made sure that Geraldine didn't know anything about the sitters that were coming to her as well. So I think that the evidence that she produces there is very good and she did it by automatic writing. From experience that, yeah, have I had contact from Arthur? Yes, I think I have. Um, and one of the things was that he was trying to convey, he told the medium actually just to take it down by dictation and said just to say this, that the communication is from one mind to another. You don't actually need voices. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I still think that the next world is how you make it, how what you think it should be like. I think the one thing I have become, um, come to believe as without my interest as I could do research is that um, I do not believe that consciousness is is just the froth produced by the brain, mm -hmm. um, even though that is the view most scientists adopt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a reductionist in that sense, and I do, in principle, believe that, that consciousness can operate on a, on a broader sphere than just the human brains. Um, and so in that sense, um, I, I suppose I'm predisposed to believe in some form of survival. But then if you ask, um, there is a survival, the question is, well, what do you mean by the, the me that wants to go to survive? And you have to sort of find very carefully what do we mean by survival. The question is, to what extent one's individual identity is, to what sense is it? Is it David Fontana, the same David Fontana as we do in life? And of course, that is just a mystery. And, and, my view is that from the perspective of psychical research, I don't think psychical research will ever prove or disprove whether there's a survival, because there will always be different ways of interpreting the phenomena. Um, but if you're predisposed to believe in survival, you'll find an evidence for it. If you're predisposed to be, you know, not believe in survival, you'll interpret the data in another way. So I don't think psychical research will ever give you a conclusive answer. And there will always be an element of the individual who want to it will believe what they want because every religion will give you a different view. Mm -hmm. But to me, the fact is that 
The fact that it will always remain a mystery until we take that final journey ourselves is, I think, part of the allure, actually. I think if we all knew for sure, it would be really rather, it would be rather dull. And of course, the, the irony is there are billions of people who are quite convinced in the afterlife, and, you know, the people that, who, who believe, in, especially in Hinduism, Buddhism, and many of the religions, it's just taken for granted. Even though, as I think I know, I said, that this, that many people in our culture prefer not even to talk about it at all. So the answer is, I just don't know, but I just think, you know, it's fascinating to examine the evidence. Mm. Uh, my, own, my own view is, this is a, a very important question, but one we don't actually spend enough time thinking about. Um, and, you know, to an extent, perhaps it might be a good thing we don't think too much about it. I, I, I think we can't really know. I, there might be as many different experiences of an afterlife as we have each individually different experiences of the world ourselves. I mean, one of the things about so many side experiences is we can say that one thing is they're often connected with emotional states, and also they are often deeply and intensely personal. Hmm. Now, as you know, our personality is all very enormously, so it could be that there might be many different things of survival and so forth. We don't really know. Certainly, I think it would be very difficult for us here in the in the, in the flesh to actually uh, have a conception of what it could be like in the same way that someone who might always be blind wouldn't be able to you know, have a conception of how to distinguish between different colours. It may be that fundamental again. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, what Alan has just said, well, of course I fully corroborate because we are told by communicators that there are so many different levels of the afterlife. Infinite level that I don't know, or, the, or anybody knows. But uh, more than that, I think what Alan has said this morning is very important. How can you think of the afterlife, if you can think in any way, which is helpful. But William James' definition seems to be, to be the most appropriate one. More. Also, when David said here and now, I would say here and now, however, outside of time, in another space. That's what they have conveyed. Just to follow up, can I ask you, Les, um, within transpersonal psychology, how central is the issue of survival? It was clearly a key issue in David's life, but within the field of transpersonal psychology, is the question of survival something people put a lot of it thinking about? I think the answer is no. I think um, in transpersonal psychology is centrally interested in, in the psychological dimension of people's experiences. Someone might experience the after, or take a near-death experience. You know, they're, they're very important experiences in, in as much as what they teach us about the realms we inhabit and what it means for us and how it changes our lives. Um, the, as it were, ontological reality of some other dimension is not something that psychology can really address. Thank you. So I'd like to say a quick word on Shane's work. Because the detainees may not be aware of this. As long as it's Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is the only film that's been made about the Skull Experiment and on the Rashi's experiments and things. I don't even know if it's on YouTube. It's on Tully Art and Investigation. And it features David Fontana quite a lot. And what he did before he dies. So you might be interested in that film. Maybe you can let people know how they get hold of it afterwards if you want. Just Google the name After Life Investigation and you'll get the website. <coughs> yes, I know, I know. Um, next on the list is Guy.
Drumming is not a good evidence in favor of soul because if you were up to any sort of fakery, you, you'd use an LP or a deep, um, what do you call them, uh, CD. CD. And, and not many people probably have the old 78s of the original Graph Man in our Formandy recording, which we did, absolutely. So that's that one. And then the um, German message on the tape is also interesting, where it says, be, be I'm stuff. Which is actually not correct German. It's like saying like a dust in the wind in English. As my German neighbor told me, that is really wrong. It's like um, Einstein, and it's like um, dust. And also, it's not what Luther wrote in the Lutheran Bible. So, there's another mystery to sort out. And finally, um, the reasons why Skoll came to an end. I remember distinctly at the time hearing either from Monty or Mrs. Monty. They, um, the Skull team got completely freaked out by being a picture of what they assumed was an E.T. I can't blame them. It is in the book, it's in the report. And it doesn't look pretty odd. So that's my thing. So is that, do you think that was meant to be the higher authority, or is that just a, another thing that put them off? I think it's another thing that put them off. Okay. But it just, just Guy's remark just illustrate that you know the, the complex issues of, of interpretation that arise. Once you're entering the domain of mind, that you know there, there you get the whole issue of it, are things as they appear to be. The real spirit, or is it some person joker, or is it ET? Anyway, sorry. Uh, let me ask someone else to ask the question. Mary Rose. Well, the first two nights I went, I'd like people to thank you for organizing this day and giving you an interesting team of students. And also remind us that David von Tarnow was probably the nicest person I ever came to know. I don't think I was heard to say anything I'm talking about anyone. And also to uh, suggest that his uh, greatest legacy is actually his book uh, on the afterlife, which examines every conceivable angle in a very critical way. And uh, I think that is the, you know, the most interesting thing from our point of view that you have read from this. Yes, of course, Mary has got Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um, it was actually the question that arose this morning um, about several people who had been referred in, in sort of mental, appeared mental problems. And yet, actually, they probably were not. Um, they, they were people who perhaps had had out-of-the-body experiences, or um, sometimes... If, I know that near-death experiences are better known now, but out-of-the-body experiences are not so much. Um, and many years ago, Arthur had this problem. He actually met someone up in Glasgow um, through Trisha Robertson to help this girl who had been referred by her GP to a psych psychiatrist because she was actually having um, what appeared to be mediumistic events. And so the, the GP actually just thought, well, she was actually something going wrong with her mentally now. And so we don't talk about it now. I know the difficulty with academics often, it's getting better because of people like Chris, but academics very often are very careful of what they were saying because of their careers, and that's perfectly understandable. But obviously there's not enough in the general market for people like GPs or some hospital doctors to read in order to help a lot of people as needed this morning from that question. Um, it's an opportunity for me to mention, actually, a, a, an unashamed plug, because we have a conference in Liverpool, where, where I'm based, this coming week on Thursday, actually, on psychosis and spirituality. Uh, subtitle being Inner Journeys, was it Inner Journeys? In, in, inner Journeys in a Time of Transition. And, uh, I mean, I'm not just plugging the fact that I'm all involved in this conference, but the fact is that the, there, there is considerable change taking place. And so the conference is, if you like, just an indicator. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not disagreeing that these kind of things are very problematic, and, mm -hmm. and many psychiatrists are somewhat two-dimensional, two, two 
and there are ongoing problems, but let's not fail to recognize the changes that are occurring. And again, I think it's, you know, it's on the back of people like David, yeah. who has moved things forward, yeah. and others, and, uh, and it's yeah. to be welcomed. Yeah. But it's sold out, the <laughs> conference. <laughs> okay, well. now, first, uh, the, sorry, I've got the name, is Rupert. Nice. Hi. Um, Rupert, uh, this is a question for Marion, actually. I was struck that after the second sitting, both Ralph Noyes, the OSDR on the set, and two members of the group all left. I, I don't know if there's any significance of this one. Um, no, no significance. Ralph actually wasn't very well at the time. Um, and so that's why he decided. It was actually meant that you actually stayed, they had to stay the night with Monty, always. So it involved really two days. And so Ralph actually found that too much. And obviously that was why occasionally um, one or other of the three investigators could make it because they were all working at the time. But I don't think that's significant, no. And the two members, the group members? Right? No, they've, I, they've just had enough of their journeys actually by then because they've been doing it for two years already. And it's worth pointing out that the people who did visit also not only had the experience of school, but they also did experience the, the hospitality of Monty. And uh, I certainly went on many occasions and enjoyed Monty's hospitality. So, the uh, lady at the back. Hello, yes, I'm Judy Carter. Um, going back to the comment that was made about you know, the mental health issues and maybe the misinterpretation of certain events. Um, I was talking once to a children's bereavement counsellor and we were talking about you know, ideas about survival and she said, well the thing is, we just don't know anything, do we? And I said, well, I've called David's Is There an Afterlife down off the shelf and I said, have you ever come across this? I said, you know, you can't prove, you didn't prove anything one way or the other but we do know, we do have some knowledge, things, you know, we have People for way over a hundred years have been looking into this, you know, in a very, very academic sort of way, and then there's been a lot of scholarship involved. And she goes, oh, I've never heard of this. Oh, the SP, what is this? Oh, oh yes. Now, life after death is now on syllabus for children um, schooled in the army options. And I just wonder if there's been any kind of link between Department of Education and the National Curriculum with the SPR because what will they be telling them about life after death in their RE classes? Um, it's not life after death necessarily from the perspectives of the, of the major world religions either. It's like, is there one? What do we know about it? And I really don't think any of these teachers would have read any of these key mm. works about this. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Would, because after all, there are all these courses which are being now run at university level, transpersonal psychology and parapsychology for that matter. Does any of this go down to school? And you can go first, yeah. No, I just want to uh, you know, reinforce what you're saying. I think, I think it's a very big problem in our society that, that what is taught in the name of religion, spirituality, etc., is being taught by people who actually do not have any real knowledge in those areas. And I think it's a real indictment. Mm. I feel very strongly about it. And I think, you know, I don't think, I don't have missionary zeal, but uh, my work with transpersonal psychology, you know, I like to think that we can, we can slowly, slowly bring about some reappraisal of these areas and and just to mention in passing with again with David Fontana in mind one of his works one of his books was about um, meditation in the classroom you know so and and that's another measure of the man that he was interested in that kind of situation it's crucial of course he was involved in education all the way through so it's very important yes I was just going to add I've got more contact with A-level teachers and in my experience, they're desperate for good information and they're quite happy to communicate that to their students. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a running battle at the moment because one of the A-level syllabuses for psychology has anomalistic psychology on the syllabus. 
and there's a real danger that that's going to be hijacked by the sceptical arm of psychology so that it is essentially why you might think something is psychic when it isn't, why you might think there's such a thing as survival when there isn't. And I think it's very important that we engage with that debate and we put out good material. So David was prolific in writing books, popular books. If we had more time, if there were more of us, I think that's absolutely the first priority. I think one of the big problems that is, is actually faced is, is actually the approach of so many key decision makers in the various branches of, of the mass media. Uh, that is they want to cover, and it's not just parapsychology and psychical research, science, but science generally, they only want to have it included if it's seen as entertainment. And in fact, it's one of, the, one of the things, one of the great lights of American scepticism. Uh, the late Robert Baker, who was the, the kind of head of oh, the, the type of people who you know, believe were just meaningful, meaningless chemicals all look up to. I mean, he said the problem at the end of the 20th century is so many people just want to be entertained. And that's where skepticism has, has, has seized the march, has seized the opportunity. You know, it's a series of country trips and down the road, and seriously, this is why I'm glad this is back in circulation. Because it is actually an intelligent work by first class minds. And that is what actually we have to get our, our, our minds. We've got to actually uh, fulfil that trick of being both serious, sensible, and, and entertaining, heaven forbid, at the, at the main time. And don't expect a fair hearing. You have to be prepared to, to fight in exactly the same terms as you're up against. It's a shame that it was different a generation ago. Where there were people like Arthur Kersler, for instance, mm. uh, who was, you know, there in the media. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem. I think it's only a temporary problem of our culture. I think, the way the world is going, we are going to need a lot more intelligent thinking on a whole lot of subjects. And I think that the opportunity will, will grow. Well, I think I'm going to draw a, the discussion to a close now, because we are running late. And I think that was a very appropriate question on...